maybe we can start from your new show that is opening tonight and from the title of the show, which sure. is The World Doesn't End. Yes. Is it an optimistic title or a hopeless title? Yeah, that's a good question. I, f I have such a hard time with binaries, you mm -hmm. know, optimism, pessimism. Um, but maybe I'll just start out with um, where it came from. And actually, I'll read a little bit to you guys. I hope you're open for some poetry. So the title is from one of my favorite books of poetry by Charles Simic, and the book is titled The World Doesn't End. Um, a couple of years ago, my husband, he's really the poem connoisseur. He's really about poetry. So every once in a while, he'll put a book in my studio that he knows will do something to me. So I remember just walking into my studio, and this was laying there, and I opened it up, and I read the first poem, and it was like, hit me. So um, that's where the title comes mm -hmm. from. And I'll read three poems, my favorites from here, and I think maybe the poems will tell you what I think about pessimism or optimism. Okay. Um, so they're not titled, which I really like, so the poems themselves are sort of like run-on sentences. My mother was a braid of black smoke. She bore me swaddled over the burning cities. The sky was a vast and windy place for a child to play. We met many others who were just like us. They were trying to put on their overcoats with arms made of smoke. The high heavens were full of little shrunken deaf ears instead of stars. Mm -hmm. I'll read two. <laughs> the stone is a mirror which works poorly. Nothing in it but dimness. Your dimness or its dimness, who's to say? In the hush, your heart sounds like a black cricket. So if you want more, you should get your own. <laughs> um, but Charles Simic, for those who don't know, he just died last year. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner poet. He was a po poet laureate. And um, he, like me, was born in former Yugoslavia. And um, his family immigrated to the US after World War II. So I, I really relate to his biography, obviously for the obvious reasons, but also there's something in his work and his poetry that has an element of mystery, darkness, but it's also playful. Mm. And I feel like the poems in this book and the title really um, spoke to me as I was making this work. Mm. That's so beautiful. Uh, and just to continue talking about binary and, yes. and, and polarity, tell us about the genesis of the show and how you're displaying large scale canvases here and in the other space you have much yeah. more intimate, seemingly abstract um, works on paper. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a painter who really likes extremes. <laughs> Maybe that's not a new thing or original thing to say. But um, I, I really love intimate, small scale. Mm -hmm. I feel like it really activates a part of my brain that's very private and very vulnerable. I think because of the size and also about my relationship to the paper, mm -hmm. there's something very caring and private about it. And then um, I usually start my studio practice by doing that for a couple of hours. By in the morning. In the, um, before I start working on the large paintings, it's almost like a, like a warm up. I've been an athlete my whole life, so there's something about like doing your preliminary exercises, you mm -hmm. sort of get ready. And I feel like it also starts, um, I feel my interiority change when I'm make, working small in the sense that like my eyes get sharper to colors and to relationships. And usually after a couple of hours, I feel like I'm ready to approach something at this scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then I sort of feel like um, I kind of leave the private and personal realm and I enter something that feels more like, um, uh, like I'm making a movie or something. Mm -hmm. There's something really grand. And I think I really like the theatricality of this format, mm -hmm. the horizontality. Um, I don't often work this way. I usually work in the vertical format. Sure. I prefer it. So um, these have been really fun in that they are, um, the format itself feels very dramatic mm -hmm. and theatrical. So. And do you see the smaller works as preparatory drawings, sketches? Is there like a tension or more like a communion between the two bodies of work? Yeah, I like, I like the word communion. Um, I don't see them as preparatory in any way or less than, you mm -hmm. know, like I don't think of them as sketches mm -hmm. because often the small works will take like as long as these big ones. 
In fact, some of the small ones in there take longer than one big, big oh. piece. So in that sense, I feel like traditionally when artists work with like um, sketches or studies, there's a, I feel like there's an inferiority to them. Mm -hmm. And I really respect my small works. <laughs> you well, know? That, they're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to read some of the titles of your work. Um, Arrival of Wild Gods, number two, Geometry of Sadness, Dark Place of Star Lines and Electricity, and On the Other Side. Uh, and I'm curious to talk a little bit more about the idea of storytelling and narration. You mentioned the cinematic aspect, uh, especially looking and thinking about the characters that appear in your work, uh, some of which I think are recurring. Yeah. in your in your practice so tell us who are these people and figures that we see in your work I think I'm painting people I wish existed in mm -hmm. this world in the sense that I feel like they're very forgiving and they allow me to be in my full complexity I feel like often as human beings um, we feel like we enact roles, mm -hmm. like we're doing the role of mother, we're doing the role of artist, we're doing the role of whatever. And I feel like these are truly beings. Mm -hmm. Like there is no, um, like they don't judge whether you're sad or happy or like kind of what I was saying with binaries. Mm -hmm. And I often say that if my people, like I think the people in my paintings are better humans than I am myself. <laughs> like so in a strange way I'm painting um, hopes of how I wish I was, mm -hmm. um, like they're very um, non-judgmental. Um, the titles often come with a very strong emotion that overwhelms me. Um, sometimes it starts with a color, like with this painting here, it's titled The Geometry of Sadness. All I knew was that I wanted to start out with a very specific green, which is that cadmium green and that central figure there. Yeah. Um, so that's the starting point often, it's just a color. Mm. And as I was just putting the first layer, I realized that I wanted this painting to be about the first home I ever lived in. Mm. Um, so I was even thinking about the rooms of my house in Bosnia and um, the lettering that you see in that square, they're all different foods I ate as a kid. Food? They're Bosnian mm. meals oh. and also names and nicknames of uh, family members that mm. I lived with. and. Um, I knew for whatever reason that in order to talk about this house, I needed to stay within the blue green palette. Mm. And I think like as artists, we create these like absurd little rules with ourselves. Mm. Like I didn't dare bring in like a magenta or a red. It just didn't make sense. Mm. So the geometry of sadness, the title really arose out of how I was feeling when I was making them. Like mm. I was really overwhelmed by sadness when I was making it, when I was thinking about my grandpa who I feel sort of estranged, like we're sort of estranged. A lot of my cousins, we don't really talk. And I, I was thinking about how the fracture of the war, often people will talk about the event as the sad thing, but I think about also what happens to a people, like a diaspora, when you're kind of scattered all over the world, like we're genetically connected, but we don't, even, we don't know anything about each other. Mm -hmm. Like I don't really know what's going on with my cousin who now lives in Germany. I don't think many of them know that I'm even a painter. Mm. So there's a sense of like um, people that once lived in a, in a small house that are kind of scattered. Mm. Um, are there other autobiographical elements in your painting? I'll often add my grandpa in here. Mm. So whenever you see a bearded figure, I don't know if there's many bearded figures in this one, but they are in the, um, the bearded men are often my, my, this doubling of my grandfather mm. and also about my father who I've never met. I've only seen a photo of him and he had a mustache mm. and my grandpa had a mustache. So that has become like a symbol. And then I started just using like this mm -hmm. shape that kind of looks like a bird, the way kids mm -hmm. would do a bird that sort of starts representing like um, just like an archetypal man mm. that was around. So they're, they are and they're not autobiographical. Mm. They start maybe being biographical, but I think they then expand mm -hmm. when I decide like a figure like this maybe needs to have an elongated ear for whatever reason, I don't know. <laughs> and then I give her this like horned hat. I don't know, they're just kind of impulses that I have to sort of like adorn them to be more than what they really mm. are. It's like I elevate their status from a family member to like a Slavic shaman or something. And do you think these characters are then trapped in your canvases or liberated? And how do you think of memory and history as you paint? 
I think, personal. Yeah, no, I like that. I think they're like activators. Mm. Like I, um, the, I mean, I don't know if they're trapped or liberated, but I do feel like they, I hope that they activate something in the viewer that feels free. Mm. Like maybe they activate an emotion that they don't have access to. I feel like even if we want to be politically very radical, I often feel like with our bodies, we're very compartmentalized. And I hope that these figures can kind of affect the viewer on a primordial level mm -hmm. where they're sort of like feel, feel something that they're not quite sure they like, but they want to keep staying with it. I think that's a very um, generative space to be in as an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I think it's a very generative space to be in as a human being. And I just feel like everything moves so fast these days. Nobody's like ever quiet together. <laughs> and I just want them to like shut you up a little bit and just like look at each other's eyes. I kind of think like I just want intimacy all the time and nobody gives you intimacy. <laughs> and I'm just like, look at me. So anyways, they're kind of demanding our, our, our time in psychic space. Um, I was, last week I was at a talk with uh, George Kondo, the painter, and he said that artists create their own species of humanity. Mm. And he was thinking of artists, of course, like El Greco or Picasso, Modigliani. And I wonder if you ever think of the kind of humanity that you're portraying mm. in your paintings? I do. I think I'm, 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 like I said earlier, I think I'm trying to create a, commu a, a, a community where vulnerability is not only allowed, but actually encouraged. Mm. And, um, where we don't have to put on masks. Strangely, I give them masks as a way to sort of like be a mirror to us and how often I feel like we just keep on swapping masks throughout the day. And I feel like they're asking us to just try to not wear masks mm -hmm. and see what would happen. I think there's a lot of fear around being, like really being vulnerable and authentic. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I feel it in myself and I feel I'm a person who's actually quite open. And I wonder like if I, who's quite open, feel like I have to hide certain parts of myself. I wonder, I, I often think that many others feel that same. Mm -hmm. So I think the paintings are sort of like asking us or creating spaces where they're sort of um, telling us it's, it's okay to fall apart a little mm -hmm. bit. And you might actually get more out of it if you do. And do you see them as sort of chapters of a larger narrative or story? Do they relate to each other in a temporal way or conceptual way? Mm. I kind of think of them, maybe, maybe chapters or like different moods. Mm. Like I, I feel like they sort of provide different opportunities for accessing a certain feeling. I mean, I do that on a formal level when I give myself like palette constraints. Um, like this painting, in a strange way, it's not autobiographical at all um, in the way that this one is. Like this one is so personal and autobiographical and this one is super hallucinatory in the sense that it was based on a vision I had after a holotropic breathing event that we did at, actually at my last show. And for those who don't know, holotropic breathing became kind of big in the 70s. It's a cyclical sort of breathing that induces like, um, well, some people start crying uncontrollably. Some people start laughing. Some people are very visual, um, like I am. And you kind of start hallucinating, almost like if you're on like an acid trip or something. So um, I was really trying to depict certain things that I envisioned when I was kind of um, having this like body buzz from this like what breathing. What was your vision like? Well. It was kind of trippy in the sense that like, um, it was very emotional, like I did cry, um, but I felt like my, my soul ascended up to the sky and then all of a sudden I started growing an umbilical cord and then my umbilical cord started attaching itself to everyone else's umbilical cord. And then I started seeing different members of my family then I started seeing Alexis, she was there too, and her umbilical cord. <laughs> but then I saw people that like I admire, like, uh, like Louise Bourgeois was there, and David Is Lynch was there. Is she there now? She was in there somewhere, yeah. and like all of our umbilical cords were like buzzing. <laughs> and I had this like cheesy hippie moment of like oneness. 
And I'm like, maybe this is what they talk about feeling like the love for humanity. <laughs> and it was like totally induced by my breath. So it was this kind of like vib vibratory um, celestial umbilical cord bonding. Mm. And then I came home and I told my husband about that. And he was like, that makes me think of the um, Australian Aboriginal concept of the song lines. Mm. And is this idea of like in the dreamscape, there's like song lines that are there for everybody and we can access them if we're drumming or singing or dreaming. So I was like, okay, I'm not maybe totally tripping out. Like <laughs> others have talked about something similar to this. So anyways, that's that painting. And um, this one was just a gift. I don't know. I feel like I just showed up to the studio and all these people showed up and my hand was moving. Do you give them names? Um, I do. Uh -huh. I give some of them names and I also um, give little love notes to yeah. certain people. Like you'll see that that figure right there, it has like a this figure one? in its ear. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And if you look at the a couple of gouaches in the other space, mm -hmm. there are figures with like pronounced ears yeah. and little figures in there. That's my love letter to uh, Laurie Anderson. Yeah. That um, She has a song I love and one of the lines goes, um, she made herself a bed inside my ear. Mm -hmm. And I just love that line. So that's for Laurie Anderson right there. So I kind of like sneak little things, you know? For, you don't have to know, but if you want to know, you can ask. And, yeah. Have yeah. you ever met her? I haven't, mm -hmm. and it would be a dream. <laughs> My friend tells me that she swims in the same swimming pool as her, and I'm like, I have to start swimming and coming to New York. <laughs> um, I want to start talking a little bit about the process of painting and uh, thinking about like a comparison with uh, literature is often said that for a writer there is a lot of energy that goes in the first word of a novel or mm. or of a, a book or first sentence do you ever think of your first word or your first brush stroke or your first mark making on the canvas how do you start painting yeah. and is it very impulsive do you have drawings and sketches yeah it's very impulsive mm -hmm. everything i do is impulsive not proud of it just a fact um, so no sketches, no pre preliminary anything. Um, but I guess the way that I prepare is I have to get my body in a certain, um, and my mental space just right. So actually in that sense, I do prepare intensely. Like, um, I'm a runner and I run a lot before I get into the studio. Um, I usually sit down and I do about 10 to 15 minutes of active imagination. What is that? Um, it's something that Jung developed, Carl Jung. It's a way of like quieting your mind. Um, but unlike meditation where you're actually trying to empty yourself, mm -hmm. with active imagination, you're actually following the imagery that's arising mm -hmm. and sort of seeing where it leads you. Um, so between the running and doing that, it's like two or three hours before I start painting. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of feel like I can't, I have to be very, um, like calm inside before I start painting. Even if the stuff that I put out is very insane looking and zany, <laughs> like my body and my brain have to be like, like really, really um, like down on earth. So in that sense, I prepare. And then when my body is just right, I know what I can do. I know I'm capable of. Like there'll be days when I'm like, I did all that and I, ha I don't have it in me to work on a large painting. So then the first brush stroke will be on a small gouache mm. where I know I just have to sit. And I just get these like um, instructions from my body. It's like today is a sitting day. Do you oh. work in the same studio for both the gouache and the I do, I do. And I'll often be working on the gouache and I'm kind of glancing over at the big one. <laughs> and like after a while, I'm like constantly doing this. And if I catch my head going over like a gazillion times, I know I need to get mm -hmm. up and paint. But um, I have these little ways in which I get myself ready, but maybe they're not all about moving the hand. Sure. Do you yeah. also read a lot? Um, well, talk to me about the role of literature and reading in your yeah. work. I do. I love to read. I feel like where we live, we live in Placidas. You've been there. <laughs> it's quite remote. It's uh, in between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. I'm like kind of high up on a mountain. So there's not a lot of stimulation. And um, besides the crazy horses, besides the, cr uh, the horses, the <laughs> rattlesnakes, the, you know, the wildlife, which I like, but I feel like um, reading the kind of phrase that I have, it like lights me up. It fills my spirit with something to respond to. Um, and I feel often that writers 
I feel more kinship with writers than other mm. artists. And I think it's because, um, or poets even, because there's a, like especially in contemporary art, the landscape is very like, um, like there's a project and there is a thing that needs to be like executed and transmitted to the public. And I often feel like everything I have to give is so abstract and vague. Mm. So I sort of find per permission in literature to be who I am. Mm. Like, Do you also write yourself? I, do nothing I would want to share with others. Yeah. <laughs> a diary. But uh, yeah, I mean, I write like weird little things. I even did a book with um, Tamron Institute. Mm -hmm. We did a body of work where I made monotypes and I wrote little haiku poems okay. that are sort of are like titles for the, um, so not too much, but enough to sort of, um, I take crazy notes. My husband is always like, are you taking a test after this book? <laughs> but there's this like fear that everything is going to leave my brain after mm -hmm. I'm done. So if I really like the book, like I have a specific notebook for it and I have post-it notes and I'm underlying and highlighting, I think there's this great desire I have for like absorbing information and um, just to kind of like get it stuck on myself mm -hmm. so that I don't feel empty. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> Uh, and you mentioned that you work in quite isolated place, Las Citas. What happens when your work comes to New York in such a public space like this exhibition? What do you want people to, to feel like? Well, even just being here for a few weeks, I just notice the pace. Mm -hmm. I'm always noticing the volume of places, the speed of people, and um, just like I feel like we're living it's on like everyone is like on double time mm -hmm. and so I guess I hope that these paintings allow you to maybe just be at like normal speed at least if not like a few notches slower and you, you mentioned that you haven't seen these paintings in a while what was the first thing that you thought when you saw them again because my practice feels so childish mm -hmm. like I often say I'm not a serious artist even though I make so much in the sense that I'm not like figuring out what my project is, I'm not making sketches. I just kind of feel like I go into the studio and I play. I often worry that once they're on like serious gallery walls that my childish games are gonna not look so good, mm -hmm. you know? I'm like, oh my God, I just like doodled in my studio on Placidas and now it's like the world is gonna see it. And it's nice when I see it and like in this gorgeous lighting and like these nice walls, I'm like, okay, they're actually good children I put out into the world <laughs> I feel proud of, you know? But I, I, I never, I always worry. I'm like, oh God, like I'm not a serious artist. I'm like imposter a little bit, you know, that imposter syndrome is, is. Um, I think a lot of artists feel the same, no? I hope so, because like, it feels so fun for me to be, to, like I often feel guilty. Like, do I really get to paint? Mm -hmm. Like this is, and um, so I don't know, it's hard for me to take myself seriously sometimes. So maybe. But it's a good gift. Sometimes. Yeah, it is. I think, I think keeping that like sort of like childishness yeah. is really important to sort of like keep it's showing refreshing. up. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about the colors of your uh, paintings. There is a lot of uh, very deep uh, blues and greens and oranges and thinking about your palette of a few years ago that we can see a very big change. Your palette was much more um, translucent almost ephemeral. Yeah. Can you talk about this uh, um, transformation and what colors mean for you if they have specific symbolic meanings? Um, color is everything for me. It all starts with color. So before a line is even introduced into the painting, I'm always thinking in shapes and colors. Um, I really like an analogous palette, like I like mm -hmm. colors that are in the same family mm -hmm. because I feel like analogous colors create slowness and they, um, every time I've looked at paintings that are in that kind of analogous palette, they, I, I notice how they change my breathing mm -hmm. versus high contrast colors. Um, so that's one thing, even before the color, I like them to be sort of like grouped from the same place. Um, I like dark colors, like in this painting and in this one. And even in the yellows, I like to, like this, the first layer of this painting is a very dark purple. Mm -hmm. And I think darkness is very important to me. I think it's sort of like, I like to dim the lights in the room. 
And then I slowly in your studio or in your house? Not literally. Oh. But by <laughs> but by like painting the first layer okay. really dark. I feel like I dimmed the lights off from the yeah. paintings, you know, like it's dark in there. And then I introduce a slightly brighter color. It's like I turn on the lamp. And then I introduce another slightly lighter color. So it's like I'm slowly turning the lights on, mm -hmm. but I never want it to be fully lit. Like there's something like I think on a conceptual level that I'm really um, like, I don't want things to take place during daytime mm -hmm. when everyone is like sober and efficient. Like I'm kind of looking more for like a nocturnal, mm -hmm. slightly sedated, like Lynchian space mm -hmm. where like you're not quite sure if something is logical, if it's from dream. So uh, the palette is like, it's almost like the color itself is secondary, but the, the volume and the value of it is more important. So like this yellow, I don't think of as a joyous yellow. Mm. It's kind of like a dingy yellow, you know, like maybe like a, like a 1980s couch that your grandma might have had in her. And I was really thinking about, thinking about my grandma's couch when I was thinking about this color, like just how it felt to sit and eat potatoes. Like both things are heavy. And I wanted the painting to feel kind of like heavy, like potatoes. <laughs> I didn't answer your question. Did it's I? okay. <laughs> um, there, is, there has been a lot written about the geometry in your paintings and geometry is something that comes up also in titles um, and I think some critics have compared your work to the great Hilma of Klimt also for the use of colors and forced geometry but um, thinking of abstract composition and geometry I think um, I read something written by the great author Susan Albert who mm. said that she could uh, see a comparison between your, your geometry and that of the woven rugs of Bosnian tradition. So thinking about a sort of comparison with the textile world and the craft or so-called craft world. Yeah. So I'm curious to see if you ever think about that tradition. I do a lot. And actually, um, it's a more honest way to, I think, to talk about my work in terms of textiles than even those amazing artists that people often bring up, like Hilma of Klimt and Paul Clay, who I love. But I do think about textiles even more than those painters. Um, my grandma um, was a Bosnian, Bosnian Muslim and she did pray in our house and she would put the little kilim rugs. So I remember thinking they were really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And even the rugs in a lot of Bosnian households are um, often layered one on top of another. So there's a sense of like clashing colors and clashing patterns that I'm really attracted to. Um, but also when we first uh, when we first moved to the U.S. and my mom's job still actually is refurbishing vintage clothing. Mm. So growing up, I was always around a lot of like um, uh, like brand names that were old or ripped. So my mom would like take a Prada mm. shirt and like fix it up and then sell it at a flea market. Mm. So I was always around things that once upon a time were high end but are now old and torn, and then they were elevated again. So I think it's really also that, that sense of like something that's valued, that's textile, that's like mended by her hands and that that's then elevated. Um, I kind of like things that seem pathetic and kind of sad that are then elevated to like a higher, mm -hmm. higher status. So yeah, it's like my grandma and the rugs that were all around our house growing up, but also my mom. And also just like, I really respond to pattern. Mm -hmm. There's just something really rhythmic and, um, I find that people who are really like high strung, like myself, we really like patterns. Like I have a lot of friends it who are calms like, you down. there's something really calming and there's something mm -hmm. also like it creates um, like a vibration in the painting that I feel like allows me to then populate the figures on top of the patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's both visual. Does it work as a backdrop for your figures or the two planes are kind of in dialogue? I think they're more in dialogue mm -hmm. than a backdrop. Like I often think about how a pattern can become a symbol too. Like if you look at the sun over there, it's not really a sun. It's also like some insect. <laughs> um, it's um, like a lot of spidery motifs mm -hmm. came out of just my desire to make like a, like a orb and then a lot of little spindly things coming out of it. So patterns often become symbols and vice versa. And this painting has that L 
kind of going around a lot and I was thinking a lot about rugs and how mm. they have the little like ruffles. Sure. But also like L is a symbol I use a lot to represent time. Um, and I kind of think of them as feet marching. Mm. So you'll see feet marching in this like linear way that I think about um, the contemporary moment, but also time going up. That's kind of a more spiritual relationship to the mm. cosmos. And then legs, like feet that are going backwards and they're upside down. For those of you who are familiar with Twin Peaks, it's kind of like being in the Black Lodge. <laughs> so kind of like the, that's kind of how I think about that. Mm -hmm. And then the feet sort of going down. Um, I'm also kind of thinking about history mm -hmm. in terms of the like, um, the Sick samsara like wheel mm -hmm. in Buddhism, um, which I believe um, translates in Sanskrit to wandering, mm -hmm. the word samsara. Um, and it's, uh, it's this idea of death and rebirth. And I often think about history this way, like we see things that have been done, they're getting repeated. Mm -hmm. And there's this like humanity conveyor belt that's disgusting, <laughs> but also just keeps going. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I don't know, it just kind of, but it started out as a pattern, right? Mm -hmm. I was just kind of adorning the painting. And then I'm like, no, these are feet. Oh no, <laughs> the feet are time. So it's like, I started with one simple thing and it sprouts. Mm -hmm legs. <laughs> Have you ever made a textile work or a more sculptural object? We actually did, but it was yeah. a failed experiment. <laughs> um, so more to come maybe. Okay. It was, it was, we learned a lot, let's put it that way. We, I, I was trying to make some um, uh, tapestries okay. um, using my gouaches as like a jumping off point, but it didn't quite work out. So I learned. With textile or with paper? No, with actual textile, okay. with fibers. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't need to talk about that. Okay, we're but not I gonna did talk about that. <laughs> we're gonna talk about subconscious instead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned often that you are uh, influenced by Jungian psychology. So yeah. I want to hear more about this and the idea of the shadow self and thinking about whether the practice of painting is also a healing practice for you. Absolutely. I mean, when I think about how I started painting, mm -hmm. it was when I was at a refugee camp and my mom somehow found a box of watercolors and some paper and I started painting in our little room in the back. I think she had an instinct that I needed to express myself. As a kid, I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but I think my mom intuited that there was something that maybe I needed to get out and she knew that maybe it wasn't verbal. Hmm. So um, that's kind of my origin. It was always as a way to get something out and to heal. And I wasn't necessarily like a stellar art student. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember not getting A's in my art classes. So, and it's, it's interesting that I never really wanted to make art because I wanted to perfect a skill mm -hmm. or to learn how to draw realistically. It was always, I always had this impulse to express. Mm -hmm. So it was always expressive. Um, and what was the first part of your question? The Sorry. Jung. Oh, the Jung, the <laughs> shadow, right. Um, well, I became interested in Carl Jung and the shadow self because I realized I make work from my own shadow mm -hmm. and people are into it. So there must be something there. Maybe people are yearning to express their shadow self. Mm -hmm. And this whole idea, for those who don't know, and I'm not a Jungian, so please don't you know, go look into it further, but it's this idea that there are elements of our psyche that we repress, that we feel are not gonna be acceptable by those around us. So some of our fantasies, some of our fetishes, some of our desires, all of that is this thing that we repress. And the idea is that when you repress it, it just comes out in an even more menacing way. So the idea is that if you're tending to your shadow self in hopefully a more healthy outlet, that um, your psyche will be more unified. So there, there's this idea that our psyche can get fragmented. And that really resonated for me because um, my entire family is composed of people who have PTSD. <laughs> and I have watched their psyches fragment and see what their shadow does, such as addiction or, um, you know, tending to behaviors that are harmful and things like that. And um, I became interested in it because I started noticing, like, why am I doing, why, why is it that I chose art while somebody in my family has chosen drugs or something mm -hmm. like that. And I, and I realized the more that I thought about it that we actually have the same need mm -hmm. 
and the need is to be seen and to be heard and to be touched and to be felt, I just somehow ended up figuring out a more healthy outlet. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, tending with the shadow, I think on a collective level is really important too, because I think we're living in a moment, and I'm no, I know all of you know, it's like super polarized politically. Mm -hmm. I think both the right and the left, there's so much policing going around with what's acceptable behavior, what's, what you're allowed to say. People, myself included, will say things or like, I wouldn't say this in mixed company. What you're really saying is that there's this shadow self I have that I don't feel like I can express because I will get, I will lose friends or I will do that. And I just know that that is a very dark thing to do, to start hiding our shadow so much if we're doing it on a collective level. I mean, you see what happened with the Nazis. Like you see, I remember my mom saying that right before the war broke out in, um, in former Yugoslavia, people started policing each other's jokes. Mm -hmm. She was saying that about two years before the war, people were like, jokes were like getting so polished and there was this like strictness and erectness. And two years later, we had a genocide. So I think um, we're living in a similar moment where there's a lot of fear and a lot of repression. And I think people are gonna do weird things. Mm -hmm. And um, so I try to make work that's sort of telling people that weird thing you're thinking about that you don't feel like you can say, you can say here. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's a cheesy thing to think paintings can do, but I think that's the that's the hope I have. Of course. Almost like a receptacle for like disgusting thoughts. <laughs> and tell us more about your upbringing. Uh, was there an artist in your family? How did you get introduced to art? Uh, was uh, art a way of, you know, escape? Not, I mean, not in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. no. Um, I grew up, even before the war, um, poor little family. We, we were um, farmers. We lived in a little village. My mom is actually the only person in my whole family who went to college. And she didn't finish because she ended up getting pregnant with me. Um, so nobody was really in high culture, if you know. And it feels very strange for me to come from that and to be an artist and showing in, you know, it's like a, it's a very strange thing to be an artist who may, who started making work from a place of pain and then like to end up here. It, it's very bizarre. But my grandpa weaved baskets. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was always around folk art. And I remember one of my favorite memories as a kid is to sit next to him. Um, he had a little shack and he would weave his baskets and I actually have one at home. Mm -hmm. And he would go and sell them at the flea market. So I've always been around people who made things and then sold them at flea markets. So that has been like the sort of like market mm -hmm. space that I grew up around. Mm -hmm. um, and in a strange way, he was the most like, um, he was my favorite person growing up because I felt like he had his thing that he did that was very private, that was very personal, and he allowed me to sit next to him. And just even watching him like shave really thin pieces of wood and kind of braid them and transform that into these gorgeous little baskets was... Mm. Have you been back to Bosnia many times? I've been about six times mm -hmm. since we left in the mid-90s, so mm -hmm. not too many times. It, it's very... Um, it's very triggering for me to go back, to use that word, yeah. in the sense that, um, it's triggering in the sense that like, I have family who has stayed there and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of feelings with those who stayed there during the war towards those who fled and sure. left and became other. And there's a lot of, um, I don't know what word to use other than um, intensity. Like mm -hmm. you could feel the, the judgment for leaving and not actually sure. surviving the way they survived. Mm -hmm. So it feels very violent for me to go back to visit my family. It actually doesn't feel cozy. Mm -hmm. And then when I go back, I've been back a few times for art shows sure. and I get that same sense from artists who were born during the war, who make work that's not, um, really made for the market. They do a lot of performance art and, and a lot of like really radical performances. And um, I feel very, um, like they judge the diaspora. Mm. So I really feel like I'm not even making work as a Bosnian, I'm making work as like a artist who comes from a diaspora. 
So in a strange way, I feel more accepted by the world sure. than I do by the place I come from. But is it important for you to show that? I think I try to make it work and mm -hmm. I realize that I just have to respect the boundaries sure. and I think they don't want me to show there that mm -hmm. much in the sense where they feel like you already have everything out there. We have what we have here. It's so wounded, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like a place that's wounded, they in a strange way want to just deal with their own wounds. They, I'm an outsider. I'm 40 years old and I left when I was seven. Do you still speak the language or not? I do, but like in a in a funny way, you mm -hmm. know, like I sound like an outsider. So it's it's really an interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I would love to show there and I think the right context maybe will present itself, but mm -hmm. it's not like, a, oh yeah, just go show. I feel like sure. it, it's really, um, it. I push a lot of buttons mm -hmm. or I, I feel like it presses a lot of, yeah. And from there to New Mexico, and maybe we can almost conclude the talk with this question. Um, I know you moved there a few years ago because you were in a residency program at Roswell. How is it to live there? Yeah, well, my husband was actually my um, Joshua Hagler, who's a painter as well. He got the residency. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, the Roswell Artist and Residency Program is amazing. I highly encourage applying. But it's a year-long program, and they actually um, support the partner, if you have a partner who's also an artist. Mm -hmm. So Josh got a big studio, and I, for the first time, had a big studio. It was like 600 square feet. It was the biggest studio I ever had at that time. So, um, yeah, it allowed me to be a full-time artist for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. When we lived in L.A. and in San Francisco, I had, like, like most artists, like numerous jobs. I was hardly in my studio. I felt more of a hobbyist than a real sure. painter. And something about being in a place where your overhead was so low, mm -hmm. we were given a stipend and I had big studios, there was a wood shop, everything was cheap. So when you live in a cheap place, you can actually take greater risks. Sure. And um, I feel like both of our careers really took off mm -hmm. when we became full-time artists. Mm -hmm. So there's something that's actually really um, non-mysterious about it. We literally just started sure. painting all the time instead of sometimes. But there is also something very special about New Mexico because yes. for so many um, years it's been a place of refuge, of escape and yeah. of healing for artists as well. Yeah. Thinking about the uh, transcendentalist group in the 30s and then of course most recently yeah. George O'Keefe or the yeah. great community of artists yeah. that live there now so I'm curious if you feel connected to that I do. tradition. I really do and I what I love about New Mexico the most is that it when people come to visit about 20 percent of people are like wow <laughs> hidden gem Those and 80 percent of people are like I can feel like they can't wait to leave. <laughs> And I kind of like that it's like that, yeah. you know, it's like really like a secret gem that's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's like a, I feel like we discovered something really good mm -hmm. in the sense, the landscape is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it's also very harsh, like the winters are harsh. Do you it's, ever paint outside or? No, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, it's funny because my, my work is such an excavation mm -hmm. process. I really don't care where I am. I just need like a space. Um, but my husband does. He does mm -hmm. um, paint outside and spend a lot of time outside and put it in. But I, I don't. But the vibration of New Mexico, I really understand. Mm. I mean, I know why Agnes Martin Do you feel it. it is a spiritual place? Oh, yeah. Mm. It's like, it's a really intense spiritual place. Mm. It's not like cute spiritual, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, like, oh, let's like burn some sage. It's like really, like it's but gonna, you are burning it's sage. gonna show you your shadow spiritual <laughs> type of space. Yeah, well, I think yeah. this is a great way. Thank of you. Ending. Um, maybe we open up if the audience has any question. Yeah. The leap from going from like a city to like a really remote place. It was very anxiety. Yeah, I mean, it was very anxiety evoking. And I remember um, 
it was really um, like my ego was checked often because my husband and I both applied and I didn't get it and he got it. <laughs> And then I wanted to be like a badass feminist and like not follow my dude, you know, <laughs> like, so then I was like, well, a feminist doesn't do this. So then literally I did a, like a meditation. And in that meditation, I got like, I saw, um, I had these visuals of, of tortoises and cacti. And it was literally, I know that sounds absurd, but it was like, I got this like intuition that those symbols represented the desert and that I should do it. So I had to put all my like badassery on the bad back burner and just like be like intimate with myself and like do this thing that maybe I didn't respect on some level. And then when we got there, everything was okay. Mm -hmm. So they were like, oh, um, you know, you didn't get it, but we really loved your work. Every year we have different jurors and it was just this one juror that really didn't <laughs> like your work. Uh, but here's a studio. So they basically gave me everything that I would have gotten if mm -hmm. I didn't, if I got the, so that was like the first leap. But then I was afraid. I was like, God, I'm like living in the middle of nowhere. I didn't have a gallery at the time. I'm like, it's okay to maybe leave and live remote when you have everything. But we left when we had nothing. We had no money. We had no galleries. But then we sort of were okay with just painting and being poor. And there's something like really amazing about the surrender to not wanting accolades that then the, like things just started happening because we just like gave up wanting to be well-known artists. Like, I don't know how I even got a gallery in Dallas and then they saw my work at the Dallas Art Fair and one thing kind of led to another, but it was like things started happening once you gave up. And it's kind of like that Taoist concept of like in the emptiness, there is everything, which yes, was I anxious extremely and I mean, um, I really didn't want to do it, but I did have a moment of clarity where it's like, maybe just do the thing you don't think is a good idea. And it ended up being the best idea. And I really realized that painting demands time. And I realized how when you're in a city where everything is happening, like I would paint maybe anywhere between two and six hours a day. And then I went from painting to like eight to 20 hours a day. Like I would like, we would pull all nighters and I was like, wow, paintings get better if you paint more. Go figure. <laughs> and you just can't do that when you're working five jobs. So. They don't really come from it, but it's the same space I would say that I touch when I'm painting. Like um, I recently learned about this concept, hyperphagia and aphasia. So aphasia is this thing that people have where actually they can't construct images. So if you say, if you tell them like, imagine an apple on a branch, there are people who can't actually picture that. That's called aphasia. And then there's the other side of it, which is, which is like hyperphasia. And I really think I have it. <laughs> I self-diagnosed, <laughs> which is that when you see figures and faces in everything, everywhere, it's almost overwhelming. I don't know. It also <laughs> drives you crazy. Um, so yeah, like I see a blank canvas and it's like, I already see a whole painting. So I just feel like I have to keep up with the, with the, with the imagery as it arises. It also happens in the shower and when you're like <laughs> trying to sleep. So it's like too much, but yeah. So how do you not care? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something that was made it really easy for me. We were hustling so hard in LA, like going to every opening, shaking hands, getting studio visits, all that. I literally got sick. And my husband would laugh when I say this, but my hair started falling out. And I started get, getting eczema all over my body because I was so stressed from wanting to make it. And so then I was like, well, I'm going to like drive myself crazy and I'm getting sick. So something about my body literally starting to deteriorate was like, maybe I choose my body over my ego. So that helped. And then also being with another, my partner was also like, we always put making art ahead of everything. 
So like if we could live in a place where we could just make art and have a little community, it was more important to us than being sick and being well known. So I don't know, it's like the combo of those two things. Like you have to prioritize what makes you wanna live. So like if being famous makes you wanna live, then you kind of carve your life out that way. But if painting makes you wanna live, then you make, you know? It's like every, every decision you make and every kind of commitment you make will kind of provide a life. You just don't know what it will provide. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I don't think it's just my shadow. I think, I think they're also funny, my paintings. A lot of times people think they're just haunting and it actually, my heart sinks a little bit. Like I think there's actually really like, um, like really weird humor in here. Um, often they make me chuckle, like these figures that have these grimaces and stuff. So I don't think it's just my shadow. I think joy is in there too. Mm. And I don't know if anyone has seen Inside Out too, <laughs> but I feel like all those little characters are in here. The anxiety, the embarrassment. Yeah, I do. Th I try to allow space for all of them. Yeah. Last yeah. question? Last one, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah. And I don't think I developed it. I think it's part of my my culture. Like Bosnians are very um, oversharers. <laughs> so um, and um, they're oversharers. Um, being kind of stoic and quiet is not uh, a virtue. So uh, being gregarious, loud, big feelings, crying, burping, like it's just all allowed. So I think I was just, I was forced into this. <laughs> I didn't know any other way to be. So, but I mean, I do, I am, I do need a lot of alone time too. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.